that all started with an idea in a bar. You know, I would literally, you know, just went home and wrote a business plan from like 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. And that, that's where it all started. You found a problem. You became the solution to your problem that was then to find other people that shared the same problem. It was a, it was a seven figure transfer that was taking place. And then COVID hit and everything stopped. The transfer didn't happen. My legal bills had piled up to like 50,000. I had a team of 13 at the time. It was scary. Hey, Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Steve. Glad to be here. Now, I was trying to think about it when we spoke the other day when I heard about your book. We've known each other for, what's it been, like six, six years, something like that, seven years? Yeah, but we actually met in 2012 in a... Uh, at the MMT event, the first ever MMT event. That's right. That's right. Down at the bar downstairs. Um, yeah, that's right. Because you you met me. I think it was with uh, was it with John Rulin that you were yep. with at the time. I, I, I wedding crashed that event. I was actually not qualified, nor should I have was been allowed in that event. But I uh, I just showed up and just pretended like I was supposed to be there. And you were qualified enough to be in the bar, so that was good enough for us. And I do remember at the time. You telling me about this bar system that you were involved in. And I remember at the time going, oh, I'm not sure I get this. And then a few years later, we ended up, uh, I was coaching you. And then fast forward now, you've got this brilliant book out. All right. Uh, Tap the big idea. And we're going to be running through that. But tell us what the idea and the concept behind the beer pour was. So uh, similar to a lot of people going through challenging times in their life, you're, 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 I don't know, at least for me, I was looking for that next thing, that next thing that would light me on fire. Um, and I was on the raw end of a, a pretty large corporate deal um, in the staffing world. So I was going to invest my time and energy in finding a problem that I could solve. And not that I was spending every waking hour in, in bars and restaurants, but I, uh, I was at a bar in Baltimore and couldn't get a drink. And I just, I thought this is, this is a problem, not just for me and my friends, but it's also a problem for the bar and restaurant owners. They, they're not selling more beverages than they should. So I, I did that, you know, pitch to my friends where I said, what if we could just pour our own drinks, kind of like we pump our own gas and, you know, we can get whatever we want. And they, they said, yeah, that makes sense. Kind of like easy pass, you know, you just pay and go through the easy pass. So that was where I left the bar in 2008 and said, I'm going to, I'm going to put a business plan together to, to make that a reality. So that was a long time ago, and, and I've had a lot of failures uh, between now and then, but that's that's where it all started. Do you think COVID – now, I remember when I heard about this, the first thing that concerned me was I liked the communication uh, with with uh, the, the bar staff. You know, I, I like that kind of stuff because, you know, I mean, I don't talk to a lot of people, so being able to have a little bit of banter with someone knocking up my drink, I'm quite happy with – what well, you did took that out, but then we went through COVID. Now, did COVID help or, or, or hurt this industry? Well, I don't want to give away too much in the book, but I, I will say that uh, it, it helped. It, it was a net, uh, I guess, it amplified the problem. And then, you know, with the staffing challenges that continue to, 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 I guess you could say, plague the restaurant industry, that even amplified, amplified it further. Uh, going back to your statement about interaction, uh, we're taking the barrier. You know, when you go to a bar, you, you've had a you have a physical barrier between you and that person you're communicating with. Our whole goal is to get rid of the barrier and let that person be closer to you and have more interaction with you. Now, there's always going to be a place for craft beer, or I'm sorry, craft bar, uh, cocktail makers, things like that. But what we wanted to do is we want to make it so if you just wanted to sample an old fashioned because you don't want to spend $18 on one, you can sample an old fashioned. If you want to sample a, a, a Ruth's Greyhound, you can sample that cocktail because as you can imagine, you know, a lot of people, they just order the same thing every time they go out. And this gives that person the freedom to, to sample and try beers, wines, cocktails. And that was really, you know, a, a big step for us is to go down the beverage agnostic side of the game because we really focused as our name used to be Pour My Beer and is about to be Pour My Bev, that there's way more beverages that we can dispense and, and monitor through our system. No, 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 there is no technical difficulty here, but I am jumping in to give you a PSA. 
If you like what you're hearing, if it's helping you, if it's benefiting you, I just want to let you know that there may be other ways I can help you. Jump over to stevedsims.com, learn about my speakeasies, learn about my Sims distillery, my coaching, any way that can help you. But again, if it helps you, great. If not, then listen to this podcast and at minimum action what you're doing. Anyway, I'm going to get you back to your usual showing. Enjoy the rest of the show. Bye for now. Now, you went from solving the problem that you had, which is what most entrepreneurs do. We start off pissed and aggravated because we can't find the solution, and then we actually build the solution and then sell it to other people that have got that problem. That's a classic one that uh, Elon Musk came up with, with with PayPal. You found a problem. You became the solution to your problem that was then to find other people that shared the same problem. You did that, and you did it successfully, very successfully. But why the book? When did you first start tinkering around with the book? And again, for anyone, I hate waiting until the end. It's called Tap the Big Idea by Josh Goodman, and it's all the best booksellers, and of course on Amazon, and I'll put the link below. But why did the concept of the book come up? So there's that whole concept of you, uh, you hey, the five people you hang around, you end up becoming. Um, so there's there's uh, there's content that I was consuming as as I've always said I've admired the content that you created uh, your first book and now I got your second book coming with uh, your signature on it. Uh, everyone's got these amazing stories and and when I would go to parties or gatherings and I'd tell people about these crazy stories that have took taken place in my entrepreneurial journey, they're like, man, you got to put that in a book someday. And so then when the pandemic hit. Uh, we were we'd written a draft uh, announcement for me selling 25 percent of the company to Coca-Cola. It was it was a done deal. Contracts were getting signed. Wire transfers were getting set up. It was a it was a seven figure transfer that was taking place. And then COVID hit and everything stopped. The transfer didn't happen. My legal bills had piled up to like 50,000 had a team of 13 at the time. And it was it was scary. Uh, well, so we stopped marketing. We stopped selling. We stopped supporting customers because all of our customers were closed overnight, you know, with COVID. And so going back to your question of when did I decide to write the book, I'd always wanted to, but when all of your customers are shut down and you have uh, an abundance of time, I decided to just pour that energy into let, let's get this book into the universe. And so the journey started in March of 2020. All right. So 20... What is the reader going to expect? Because you've got on there tapped a big idea. What is the reader going to expect? And then what are they actually going to receive from this book? And let's be blunt. Why should they grab it? Yeah, what has been overwhelming for me, I mean, it was a number one bestseller on Amazon the first week in four categories, beer, growth and development, entrepreneurship, small business. So that was exciting to, to hear and see. But what's been more, uh, I guess you could say, fulfilling than that is, getting called by uh, called and emails and messages from all these people that I've impacted over the last you know 15 20 years some even dating back to college where they've said what an amazing compilation of of a story but also lessons and it's very raw you know a lot of now it's being talked about but you know mental health and 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 wellness and and just uh, I guess imposter syndrome all those kind of key terms you hear in the industry I go. Th I went through a lot of that. You know, we still struggle with that in some areas, but it's it's finding the tools and the people that you can surround yourself with. But going, you know, the lessons and the stories, I feel like they're very relatable. You know, going back from high school, you know, people see me as as I'm sure you can attest. I'm a bigger guy. Uh, they assume that oh, big guy. He never probably got bullied or picked on or anything like that. Well, wrong. In middle school, I literally got slapped in the back of the neck every day going to class. Uh, I was a chunky little kid. I was I was freckled. I said I looked like Hamilton Porter from uh, the Sandlot. If you ever saw the Sandlot, um, that was tough, you know. But it shapes you. And I, I go through kind of the the how that ended up creating the life that I have now. You know, from my grit, my effort, my I'm gonna you know I'm gonna take a hit and get back up kind of kind of mentality. But it, it's it's more specific. So uh, you know, I actually go into the details of. Of how these deals came to fruition, um, how how I raised a hundred thousand and one from one investor, and then the first you know five hundred thousand dollar investment I got, and then the first multi million dollar investment I got, and then how someone stole thirty five grand from me, and how you know just all these things that you know, one time our number one employee got caught with thirty nine pounds of marijuana, and he got put in jail, and I had to figure out how I was going to deliver on all these projects when my number one 
person was no longer going to be with the company for the unforeseen future. So I think it's it's a it's a combination of taking you through the stories, but also the lessons that come with those stories that I feel, uh, I guess, going back to the original statement, the people that have read it have said they can't put it down. Like it's it's a one sit down, knock it out in six or seven hours or a flight from East Coast to West Coast or whatever. It's it's a it's written in a way that kind of keeps pulling you in. Like, I want to know what that next chapter or that next lesson or that next story is. Now, you mentioned quite openly that you gate crashed an event just so you could be in the right room. That takes that kind of resilience and resolve that says, hey, I- I'm going to show up. Most people today don't show up. They listen to those people on their shoulders and they go, oh, I'm not qualified to be there. I can't hang out. You just turn up. Was that something that you learned? Because as you said, I, I, I'm the same as you. All big guys, and I've noticed this, all big guys got picked on at school, okay? And it's always by the little fella. You never get picked on by the big fella because the little fella's earning his stripes by slapping you. But if you slap him, you're now a bully. So it's always that kind of scenario. Was it those moments that made you go, hang on a minute, I'm just going to show up? Or what was it that actually turned you turned you from that that wallflower to conqueror to just get into rooms that maybe you shouldn't even been in? I think it's curiosity. I can't say it's it's, it's curiosity of what are they talking about? And what are these people that are at a stage in life that I am not currently at that I want to get to? What are, what are the conversations they're having? And that what hit me the most when I you know wedding crashed my way into that event was just how amazing everyone was and welcoming. It's like they, it's like I joined this private country club that I didn't pay a membership fee to get into. I I just snuck through the back door and got to talk and meet with all these amazing people. And I, I, I say in the book, I really encourage people to step outside of that comfort zone and include yourself in an event that you may think you're not qualified for um, in, in other ways. I mean, there's even one section in there where I snuck on a movie set and got in a movie because I pretended like I was an extra. Um, and I got paid for it, which was even more entertaining. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I think putting yourself in those situations, you're more likely to grow from. Uh, and the more frequent you can do that, the better off you'll be. Uh, and, you know, you're going to you have to also be aware that you're going to probably get into a situation where maybe the people you're in the room with, I don't know, they're, they're very judgy. But understanding that, OK, that's not how every situation is going to be, um, you know, uh, when you when you sneak into an event or you uh, you step outside that comfort zone, I found that those events where they're judgy are usually rooms full of really unconfident people and and borderline entry level entrepreneurs, or should I say, the one entrepreneurs. When you actually move it, and, and let's let's call him out, Jason Gaynard was the guy that put that event on in Toronto that you're talking about, and Jason Gaynard does a phenomenal um, uh, skill. And making sure the room is is good. The speakers, that that good, but he really focuses on the room. And that's where he's done very, very well. And when you get into that right kind of cultivated room, um, then it can actually be very welcoming. It can also be like the Hogwarts of weird kids that, you know, we're all a bit dysfunctional, but we're all. And that's that's where it comes from. Now, your book, a couple of things I want to hone in on. One of them was that you actually um uh, mentioned the investment you got, and the other one you mentioned the the losses, the losing the contract, those bad moments, the marijuana that not you, but your employee with the marijuana, the losing the or being ripped off for the thirty five grand, all of those dark moments and those dark chapters of your entrepreneurial story. Did you get to a position shortly after that where you went? Do you know, I'm glad that happened because it happened for the good. Did you ever get to that stage? Did you find that those darkest moments was your greatest growth? I remember feeling helpless in a lot of those moments. And I remember specifically, you know, no, nothing against the Irish, but the Irish guys that, that they, they not only owed me 100000 and didn't pay me uh, when we parted ways, but they decided to sue myself and my business partner, Declan, when we first started Pour My Beer. And I just remember feeling like I'm a good guy. I, I I didn't do anything, you know, out of ill will to them or, and it just, it was such a, just, my lawyer told me, he said, you know, not everyone plays a team sport. And that's, you know, I come from a team sport mentality. And for me, that was the toughest pill to swallow is these are people that I've, I've literally killed myself for to try to get their business off the ground. And 
I was contractually owed money and they just decided to not just not pay me, but also sue me and try to put me out of business before the business got started. And I, I can look back on that now, similar to the bullies. You know, if, if the bullies did not bully me, I would not have done as well as I did in athletics, you know, earning a full scholarship to college and setting the school record and tackles and um, just having that that chip on my shoulder because of these people that, you know, took advantage of my lack of confidence at that age, I guess you could say. Uh, but I, I can look back now and say, well, they were probably bullied themselves by their parents or by their, you know, whoever. And they were just, you know, mirroring what, what that was on me. Uh, going back into the the Irish uh, people that sued me and, and tried to put me out of business, I am thankful for that because, A, it taught me a skill that I wouldn't have had if I did not get sued. Not that I enjoy being sued and I don't want to be sued, but I'm not scared of it. You know, it, I, I survived a federal court case where they they literally paid a PR company to advertise that they were suing me to try to get us no one to do business with us. So it was it was a pretty interesting strategic play on their end, but I'm here and they're not, you know, and, and I think that the, the time uh, tells you who the winner is, you know, and that's the, that's something I always, at the time, I, I didn't see that as a reality. It was, I was kind of in the, in the, the, the dirtiest of the dirt, if you will, like just trying to just survive from week to week. But now I can say that every one of those has, has created a muscle that I would not have had if I did not go through them. Oh, I like that. Created a muscle that you didn't know you'd had. You had. That's good. That's good. I want to flip now to something else, which is the investment. And I've been reading through Damon John, um, and I've been reading through a bunch of his books and stuff at the moment. And he talks about gaining investment can sometimes be one of the worst things that that happens. And I know I've had businesses and I've got investors, and all of a sudden, that small investors but you end up responding to them and now you're kind of working for them. What was your relationship to getting investment? How did you find, did you find it easy? Was it difficult? What do you have to share on that? So the, the chapter about it is, is how not to raise capital, but still raise capital. That's uh that was kind of, I thought that was an interesting way to go about it. I never, I, I my advice to any entrepreneur is go sell. Don't, you know, raising capital. Yes. There's certain, companies that are going to need more need more capital than others. But I, I was never reliant on an investment to survive. I was able to sell and that that was it. It takes you from a place of want and need to it'd be nice to have it. Um, so, you know, the investments that came into the company early on were pretty small checks. They were the largest checks I've ever seen, but like 30,000 uh, from one one uh, private investor and I think another 30 or 40,000 from another investor. And then the first six figure investment happened just, I would say, by chance. It was just a, a friend of a friend. I met, met them in Chicago when I lived in Chicago and I presented to him. It was funny because uh, I talk about in the book, I was introduced to him as this is a whale. Like, you know, this is this is someone who's got a lot of money. And when I meet him, he's my age and he looks like he's a model for Abercrombie and Fitch. And I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to meet Daddy Warbucks or someone that, you know, that's got the, the watch out of his pocket and. Uh, you know, just th- he pulls up in a rolls or something like that. But he was just uh, a Midwestern guy that that made a good amount of money in the market. And, you know, he was doing some uh, private investing. So that was the first, I would say, six figure investment. So that was I've been fortunate in that, that the people that I've gotten money uh, that I've had invest in the company, they're good people. Um, they're, they're people that that have not, uh, I guess you could say, created extra uh anxiety or stress on me in that way. Um, and then the the New York investors, uh, they're branded strategic. They own about 30. And again, these all came to me. So that one was a situation where there was a customer and said, hey, we want to start a fund and we want to invest in companies that we're working with. We like your company. Would you be open to an investment? Um, and so that that started that conversation. So I can't say I, I, I checked the box of being that founder that's like going on the the road trips and, and and just going out there raising capital to kind of keep the doors open because we've we've been profitable really um, the whole time uh, when it comes to uh, the, the investments have gone more towards growth initiatives like point of sales integrations or uh, growing our marketing team or you know areas where it's we're not uh, there to help us grow not this is what we need to run the engine type of investments. So, but it, it, there's a lot of communication like you mentioned Chicago, you've mentioned New York. When you're speaking to people about money 
Now, they came to you, but you're still talking about a subject and a topic to a different culture. You know, you, you've gone from, hey, this is my product to, hey, I can make you money. There are different conversations. Did you find, were you naturally comfortable in money conversations? No, I mean, so I went to a small school in Pennsylvania called Shippensburg University. <clears throat> I started out as a as a business major and I, I, I switched to speech communications because it just seemed like the easiest major to get out of college. Um, so I do regret not taking more courses on, you know, accounting and business. Uh, my dad owned a carpet business growing up. So you would think that I would have gained some of that knowledge from him, but he really just put me in the grunt work. I was laying tax strip and, and, uh, and padding, but um, I had enough knowledge from reading a decent amount of books about finance and investments, and I could speak the speak speak the talk of you know convertible notes versus equity versus Series A, all those things. So I had a basic understanding of it. Uh, but we were an LLC when I took on most of the money. Uh, when we took on the Series A, we converted to an uh, an Inc. Uh, that you know the company that you know, that did that Coca Cola. It's actually Coca Cola Euro Pacific Partners. Um, so they're we had to grow up, I would say, uh, to, to, to get to that point. But, you know, anytime I had a question, I had people that I could lean on to say, hey, can you can you uh, describe this to me in a way that I can comprehend it? Uh, but, you know, for the most part, it's just reading. It, it's reading the right books and talking to the right people. And it, most people can can grasp those concepts if they have the right people to explain it to them. So you've got your book out. You've got tapped the big idea. What are you hoping is going to propel, apart from giving them your story, apart from giving them your insights, what do you hope is going to get them to action, think, and react to? It's been interesting because, as you, I'm sure, can relate to, your network is is such a unique blend of people. You know, there's people in my network that are teachers and <clears throat> people in my network that are principals, some that are, you know, CTOs for large companies. Uh, so it's it's been. I specifically asked people what it, what resonates with you. What what is there anything in the book that that you're going to do differently because you read the book? And it, it, it's a wide variety of different parts of the book that resonate with people. Um, I think that's one of the unique features of it is it touches on so many different parts of the the process and things that I went through personally that they can grab little sections of it and apply it to their world. Uh, you know, for instance, the the, the principal I know there was the, the whole section on. Uh, you know, experts in the field that told the person that, that invented something that it was never going to work, you know, whether it was the, you know, the, the telephone or the railroads or any of those things. And it, I found that to be really motivating for me because someone who I really respected in the draft beer and, and bar world told me, you're never going to do anything with this. It's, you know, come work for me and sell equipment for me. You're good at sales. And obviously that worked out the other way, similar to some of those other people that, that told them not to pursue what they were doing. So I think it's, if anything, it gives, hopefully it gives people a sense of confidence that, you know, they can continue to look for that big idea uh, that, you know, that applies to something that they enjoy. And, and I always say like, I'm not passionate about beer. I'm not passionate about, you know, beverages and I'm passionate about building. And that's, that's what's, that's what's fun to see what was an idea become this company that's now in over 500 locations across the United States. And we're doing 300, places in Spain, we're going to be at the Olympics in 2024. Like that all started with an idea in a bar. You know, I would literally, you know, just went home and wrote a business plan from like 10 PM to 4 AM. And that, that's where it all started. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, where's best p for people to follow you on social? I would say towards the company, you know, at pour my beer with everything, uh, the, the comp, the, the, the book tap, the big idea is, uh, you know, it's got its own website, but it's connected to the company. It's owned by the company. So anything at Pour My Beer with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, if they did want to follow me personally, I'm self poor Josh uh, on Instagram. Uh, but yeah, you know, we're, we're, we've got a plethora of videos and, and we have a map on our website. I'll, I'll make sure to give that to you as well, Steve. So your, your followers can, can find a place, pour beer and, and, and hopefully tag us on it. And when are you changing to Pour My Bev? Uh, I would say end of February, March, we're going through a lot of the creative process right now to get the logo dialed in. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's happening. Uh, it's it's kind of sad, but it's also exciting because it opens up a lot more doors for us. Sure. Um, and we're not burying Pour My Beer. It's, there, there will always be a Pour My Beer, but we're 
you know, we need to be more conscious of the rest of the beverages out there that we currently dis- dispense through our system. I could ask you a question I freaking hate, but I just want to ask you because you've been through some ups and downs. You've been ripped off. You've been lied to. You've been sued, which is basically what every entrepreneur in the planet has gone through uh, in some way, shape or form. What is the one thing that you would have done differently right at the beginning had you known what you went through? I'm trying to keep it not specific to me because the one thing I would have done is 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 not partnered with people that were just just uh, bad people. Um, I think that, in it, but it's tough to. I think just being going with your gut more. If if you if you get the feeling that whether it's an employee, a co-founder, an investor is not not aligned with you as a as a human, if they wouldn't put the shopping cart back in the in the uh, the grocery store parking lot, or if they would you know berate a, a server or someone, run. You know, unless you're that person, then maybe they're perfect for you. But like, I, th- I think just going with your gut and, and identifying that if someone is not aligned with how you are as a human, then you should not be around that person. Yep. The classic Cameron Herald, you know, a partner on culture, anything else can be taught. But if you're not sharing the same beliefs and vision, then it ain't going to work any way, shape or how. All right. We're going to give another big p- plug because Josh is my boy and I like him. Tap the Big Idea by Josh the Handsome Goodman. Josh, I'm proud of you. I was there kind of not right at the beginning, but I was there in your early stages. And I'm very proud of seeing your growth, your tenacity, and to see the book come out. And I got mine signed. In fact, it's got a lovely little note in the front, which I'm not going to share with anyone because that's mine. But proud of you, boy. Congratulations, Josh. Look after yourself. Thank you, Steve. You've, uh, you've always been an inspiration and appreciate the, uh, the mentorship. Look after yourself. And again, anyone out there, tap the big idea. It may impact you. And more than anything, it may incentivize you, spark you, make you do something different. If this guy can get a notion of a multi-million dollar business that's from the Olympics to Pepsi-Cola from just being in a bar and having a problem, what problem do you currently have that you could potentially be the solution for? This is Steve Sims of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast with my boy, Josh Goodman. Thanks for listening. Hey, I hope you liked that episode of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast. And remember, these are done for you. If you like them, subscribe, share them around. But if you don't like them, send me an email to ask at stevedsims.com and you can tell me what I need to do to make this the most dynamic podcast you listen to. Anyway, make sure whatever you learned from the last podcast, you actually do something with. Without action, it's just a bunch of people blowing air. Have a good time. Until next time. Bye.